Marty. Peter. How you doing? Doing well. Are you all settled here now? I am. I think I am. It feels, uh, feels good to be here. Moved here in October. It's beginning of March, yeah. I think we're settled. I'm trying to get my studio settled uh, at the Bitcoin Commons. Oh, at the Unchained Place? Yes. There's a lot of supply chain issues. Still going on? Still going on. And a couch was supposed to be delivered last week that you just emailed me, oh, it's going to be here in May. So. Oh, fuck, man. Because you were talking about that with your dad, right? We, Before, with like the coffee. Oh, with the coffee, yeah. Um, shout out to House Cup Coffee. Uh, they, uh, they had supply chain issues with their plastic cups that started about the middle of last year. They couldn't buy any more cups from China. They had to go to a supplier in New Hampshire, which was significantly more expensive just to get cups. And then they negotiate annual bean deals for for the coffee that they purchase and prices were up anywhere from 25 to 40 percent depending on the particular bean holy shit yeah does that mean they've just had to up their prices 25 to 40 percent themselves i don't know if it's an exact 25 to 40 percent rise but they did have to raise prices and communicate that with their clients or see this is the weird thing with all these inflation numbers because nobody i'm speaking to is telling me like oh our prices are our stock prices are going up five percent Seven percent. Everyone's like twenty percent, forty percent. It's kind of bullshit. Yeah, yeah. It's scary. What's going on right now? <laughs> you try to control a complex system like an economy, and you have these negative externalities of price prices going up because you fucked up the supply chain. Yeah, man. Well, listen. Thanks for coming on. Uh, I pitched at you an idea for a show. Mm-hmm. I'll uh, explain it to the people listening. Is that like we we essentially have the same. Well, we've both got multiple jobs because <laughs> we're fucking idiot Bitcoiners who just get ourselves super busy. But like, we have one job that's very similar. You have a podcast, I have a podcast. Uh, we're both Bitcoiners. But I always feel like we approach things almost from the opposite sides. Mm-hmm. And I thought that would be like a useful thing to talk about because uh, I think one of the I think one of the primary reasons is is like a cultural thing. Like I'm from the UK. We're in Europe. I think we're very different from Americans. And for me, it would be a useful way of trying to, in talking it through with you, it also kind of like explains to the audience why I, th- why I think that happens. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. And I think what it is, is um, we, in, in the UK and Europe, we're, we're very collectivist. Um, and everything which is on the right in the UK is probably still <laughs> like center or considered left in a lot of parts of the US. Uh, I think healthcare is like... Uh, prime example mm-hmm. in that we have this like national health system that everyone loves but we all pay into it and i think that these kind of things condition you as a british person or a european to to come at things more collectivist yeah, i could see it and it's, it's starting to leak into american culture too i mean our healthcare system is on the way to becoming completely nationalized i mean you have the uh, the obamacare act the cares act that has brought some of that healthcare collectivism to the United States. I don't think it's a good thing. But you don't think it's a good thing? No, it just increased prices and reduces the quality of the, the service, in my opinion. From what I've seen as an American who's seen the effects of that particular creep of collectivism in the healthcare system and into our country. I think you're you're right on the quality of service and, and the well, not just the day-to-day quality, but the, what you have access to. Um, there's like this thing in the UK whereby <clears throat> you'll see like uh, a fundraiser for a child who's got cancer and they're always coming to the US for treatment mm-hmm. because we don't have the uh, cancer treatment or care that you have or the high, or the highest quality. Uh, and so that's something that's like quite obvious. You, we've always, we always look to the US and we're like, oh, they have much better cancer care because of this. Uh, I think our trade-off is you don't have that, but like, if you break your arm, you can phone up an ambulance. It picks you up. You get re- you know you get your arm fixed and you go home. There's no bill, mm-hmm. and nobody's ever scared of a bill. And that's a it's a weird trade-off. Um, and I I always think it probably depends sometimes financially where you are whether you want that trade-off or not. Well, that's actually interesting because when the CARES Act got instituted here in the United States. The way it worked is once you turn 26, if you're on your parents' health care, which I was, uh, you you got kicked off your parents' health care. 
and yet you were had to fend for yourself. And if you didn't sign up for the, the carer's health care, you got fined. I believe it was like $1,200. So at that point in time, I was 26, got kicked off my parents' health care. Uh, and I was unemployed at that point in time. I wasn't making too much money. I was working some odd jobs and stuff like that. And I, and I wanted to make the decision. And I'm willing to risk it, uh, not having to pay for health care month on a month now because I don't have a steady s- stream of income. And I got fined $1,200, which at that point in my life was a material amount of money. It was like, what the fuck? Like, I'm completely willing to take the risk of not having health care. Did you know about this? I've never heard of this. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. So, and, and they find you and then, what, they leave you alone for a year? Or like, yeah. you have to get it? Yeah, that's the way I remember. I mean, it, within by the time I turned 27, I had gotten a job and was getting health care from that. Uh, from that, my employer, but yeah, at 26 when I was unemployed, I was like, yeah, I don't really need healthcare, and I got fined for it. Fuck. So you, so you, you, when you look at something like the UK's health system, you've heard of the NHS, right? Mm-hmm. Like, do you observe that and think, well, that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with that, or do you think it's more like a transition from what you have here to what we have just doesn't work? Because sometimes it's the transition which is makes it difficult. Well, I think it's, it, I would take a step back and just look at healthcare in general, not even if it's nationalized or free market, which I would argue that like the American healthcare system hasn't really been too free market for quite a while because bureaucracy and regulations has seeped in, which has created like layers of red tape and inefficiencies that have led to uh, a, a decrease in quality over time. And likewise, in the UK, I think, I mean, I, I can't really speak too much to the UK system because I've never experienced going to an NHS-associated hospital or, or doctor's office. But I imagine the, the actually the experience is somewhat similar where you go into a hospital and it's just like a bunch of white lights. Four-hour wait. Four-hour wait, a uh, bunch of beeping uh, noises, and it's very hectic and chaotic and... It's a very stressful situation in these in these hospitals, at least here in the United States. Like we had, even when my wife gave birth to our son, it's like he, she gave birth and then we couldn't even sleep because they were coming in and just like annoying us because they have to do these check-ins and all that. And um, uh, from that perspective, like I think the experience of treating an individual that being the United States or the UK has been pushed into this form-fitted framework of, oh, you need to use this equipment. Your building needs to look this way using these lights. And it's just a very almost dehumanizing and uh, brutalist experience from the design. There's no, like, if you go to a lot of the hospitals in the United States, there's no, like, uh, natural light coming in through the windows or anything like that. It's these very stuffy rooms and... Mm -hmm. I'm going down a tangent right now. I'm just trying to paint the picture of uh, some bureaucracy creeping in and forcing these these hospitals and these doctors' offices to look and feel a certain way, and for procedures to creep in that may not be necessary if, if the bureaucracy and the, and the regulations and the that were thrust on them by the federal government, which represents some form of collectivism. Um, yeah, someone that. There's two th- observations I've had with it. I, I didn't even think, didn't realize we'd talk about healthcare, but two observations, one from the US and one from the UK. We've got this parallel private system in the UK because the NHS is creaking. So we had, uh, like, I phoned up to get a doctor's appointment for something that wasn't that serious. And it was a three week wait for an appointment, which was like, what the fuck? Like, I'll probably be better in three weeks. Uh, but we've got this private doctors has opened up on like the high street in Bedford and you can get an appointment for the same day, but you pay 50 pounds. Whereas in the doctors it's free, it's 50 pounds and you get an appointment, get a full set of blood tests for like 120 pound. Uh, they do all the fucking COVID tests for when you're going away. But like this parallel systems existed where if you're willing to pay that 50 pound, you can get seen yeah. that day, which is, which is great. And then we also have this, uh, private parallel, uh, uh, insurance system whereby I am fully covered. This, this is probably amazing. I'm fully covered. Both my kids are fully covered. The highest level cover you can have 
full cancer care. So if you you know, diagnosed with cancer, they begin immediate treatment, whereas the NHS, they can be like a three, four, five month wait. And I pay £180 a month, which is compared to like the US system, it's a lot cheaper. Oh, yeah. Um, and it's a weird, it's weird how that's come about, but I think it's part subsidized by the NHS because the, it kind of like it's a, it takes a bit of pressure off mm -hmm. them. And then I've got this other observation from the US being a private system whereby. I've noticed this thing. I've talked about it before. When I, uh, when I'm watching the TV in the US, like the adverts, like every third advert is for a drug, for a condition I've never heard of. Yeah, I think we're the only country in the world that allows pharmaceutical companies to advertise the way they do, which is pretty disgusting. I mean, I have a lot of qualms with big pharma and uh, their incentive models and whether or not they actually serve to to heal people or to uh, view them as customers that revenue can be eked out of. But to your point about like that private uh, medical care system you get to, that reminds me of uh, what we call, um, what do we call them here? Emergency, uh, what the hell do we call them? Urgent care, that's what it's called. So you have urgent care um, uh, medical providers where you can go the same day, um, pay a flat fee for something. That's something I prefer. Like I've had to do that before. Mm -hmm. um, or if I had to get blood test or get prescribed a antibiotic or something like that, I'll go to urgent care and just pay that. But yeah, like here in the United States, even though you pay for insurance, like the deductibles are are insane. They're like, like ten grand, right, or something. It yeah, it depends on what what uh, what plan you have. But like, yeah, to even reap the benefits of the insurance that you're paying into, you have to spend a shit ton of money up front on top of your monthly payment that you're already paying. It's completely, the, the healthcare system here in the United States, even though compared to the UK, is less socialized, is still very socialized and very fucked up in my opinion. Yeah, this, um, I understand like the fears and issues with big pharma and I always think about if you uh, if you didn't have um, state regulation, for example, would big pharma be worse or better? I don't know. It's a tough one because it's like the incentive models of individuals or the greed well, unchecked could be perhaps even worse. Yeah, I think there's got to be. I mean, big pharma, like the pharmaceutical industries, Pfizer, and I think maybe the, um, the company behind, like Percocet have paid the biggest fines in history of yeah. any industry ever. Um, but still, that wasn't even enough to deter them from still pushing dangerous things on the populace. And so I think the incentive model needs to change from a uh, from the perspective of reprimanding these companies when they do something wrong. Like People need to go to jail. Like The, the people who own and pushed uh, the... I believe, Forget what the name of the family is, but they they pushed opiates on yeah. on the masses over the last two decades and went to a, an epidemic. They've uh, they've made a lot of money on the they, opioid crisis. Yes, like those people should be in Sackler. jail. The Sacklers, there we go. Yeah, so the Sacklers made billions of dollars. They did pay fines, but it was a cost of doing business, and they're living uh, they're living very cushy lives now after inducing a a epidemic on many areas throughout the country you know, poor neighborhoods rich neighborhoods and um, the the incentives that we've set up in our judicial system is like all right you pay the fine I can keep go about your life like those people should probably be in jail and then I think you'd see uh, better better actions from the industry because they'd they'd have that looming threat in their mind about oh, if I if I mess up it's, it's possible I could get sent to prison it's a bit like the financial crisis, right? Yes, it's exactly. exactly the same scenario. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's like one of the differences. It's like because the NHS is so you know, struggles for money. The incentive model is to treat you as little as possible. We have um, this thing called NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, and they decide the drug treatments that they will give. And every now and again, a new, <clears throat> new amazing wonder drug comes on the market, and it might be a tr treatment for, I don't know. Um, cancer, for example, and they have to make a decision whether they're, they're going to allow it because it could be you know, one, two, three million per treatment. And sometimes they reject drugs because they say the NHS can't afford it. 
So our model is very much just like, what's the minimum we can treat people and get away with it? And I feel like maybe the US one is what's the maximum we can treat people? And it's like, neither, neither are right. Yeah. And again, it's, you know, again, incentives driving all this. There's a lot of money to be made, especially around medical patents. That's another rabbit hole you can dive down. Like, are medical patents actually ethical? If you have something that could save somebody's lives, are you? And then you get into the old debate of like, yes, they spent a lot of initial investment on that research and it took a, a lot of money to get to that end product. And so the company that took all that risk should be rewarded by it. But I think there's probably a happy middle somewhere where we can agree that if these drugs are life-saving, we should figure out a way to get them to people as uh, at a, as if, as affordable as possible. But even beyond that, too, like you mentioned the commercials. Yeah. Like it's a bunch of SSRIs. Like, oh, you depressed? Can you not sleep? Like, come take our pill. That'll make you happier. Uh, and number one, they don't even do that. And they'll list the side effects, too. Like, you're going to, you, there's a potential that you might become suicidal and kill yourself. You'll, you'll have pancreas bleeding from your pancreas or whatever. Like, that, I don't think that's one, but it probably is. <laughs> there's, 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 <laughs> minutes of side effects that are listed on these commercials and it's disgusting and that's like in American society at this point in time like that's always the first option is like oh you have a you have a problem like take a pill and that's one thing that dismays me as an American is, is we don't really talk about preventative measures that can be taken like why are you depressed like maybe it's your diet that's affecting you maybe you're not working out enough and so we, we know that if you work out and you're fit you have confidence, your serotonin levels are good, your testosterone levels are good if you're a male, you're um, well balanced and you're less likely to get ailments that would require you to take a pill. Marty, you don't make any money through educating exactly. people how to live a good life. Exactly. You just want them to eat shit and take yeah. a pill. Well, that's it. I mean, that's why we're into Bitcoin, right? Like we hope that flipping that that incentive system of worrying about quarterly returns and revenue um, and just having access to cheap debt that allow you to do things, um, invest uh, in things that probably aren't overall beneficial to society, but could be beneficial to your bottom line. Let's talk about Bitcoin. That's what we're here for, dude. Did you start your podcast about the same time? Was it 17? End of 17? Start of 18? September 2017, I believe, yeah. Yeah, so that's like... And I was, I think I was November, was it November 17? Yeah, November, I think. So we pretty much lived through the same experience. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you take it all in? Because firstly, it's fucking wild living, like seeing it all happen and being in the middle of it. It's just yeah. fucking wild. You know, the last week alone, we've seen an army raising money, <laughs> <laughs> fucking raising money on Bitcoin. We've seen what's happened to the truckers, but like, there's just so much wild shit happening. Uh, and it seems to just like it seems to be like this hockey stick of like activity around Bitcoin. Like, how do you take this last four years in? I mean, it's been a wild ride for me personally. I mean, when I started the podcast, I was at Barstool Sports um, selling podcast advertisements across their their suite of of podcast on their on their network. Uh, and then, I mean, at that point, obviously, I was doing the newsletter and started the podcast and really wanted to get into Bitcoin full time and was able to do that via Great American Mining uh, in 2018, 2019. Then got into the mining industry. And yeah, for, it's surreal to see what has happened since the, the summer, fall, winter of 2017, 2018. Because, uh, I mean, Bitcoiners have been talking about this happening since I, uh, forever, since like the, not forever, but since the network launched. Like if you go back to BitcoinTalk.org, a lot of the, scenarios that have played out in reality were discussed there. Like, yeah, there will be a point in time where the central bank, like after 2008, obviously they're printing a bunch of money, they're going to continue printing money. And of course that's happened. Uh, you're going to have increased friction on the international stage that's going to push people away from the dollar and towards Bitcoin that's happening right now. Uh, you're going to have politicians coming at Bitcoin because it helps helps people evade sanctions and uh, evade uh, having to use the US dollar and that's happening right now. It's just it's just funny seeing how prescient a lot of Bitcoiners were in the early days and, and how everything, a lot of the things that people discussed for many years were laughed at 
uh, for discussing are, are coming to fruition. But I, I even doubted it a lot of it myself. Like when I read my first paper, I think it was on Nakamoto Institute about uh, hyperbitcoinization. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, but come on. <laughs> like <laughs> I get it. Like Bitcoin's this amazing asset, and yes, we can send it around the world, and yes, it you know has all these uh, benefits. But like really, hyperbitcoinization. Uh, like, do you really believe this can happen? Because I had my dad. I don't know if you just you were a believer the whole time, but I was just like, I just couldn't see it. But now, it feels like it's ha it's kind of happening. Yeah, and I think going back to the Nakamura Institute, I think the the precursor to hyper Bitcoinization is the speculative yeah. attack that piece that Pierre wrote, and uh, that's we're in, we're witnessing speculative attacks happening in many ways, whether it be El Salvador putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet and making it legal tender and, and going pretty all in, or you see Michael Saylor and other CEOs now putting it on their balance sheet, uh, issuing cheap debt, uh, cheap dollar debt to, to buy Bitcoin, um, to, to speculative attack. The dollar's inevitable debasement, um, that's coming to fruition as well. And then, yeah, I think, I mean, what's going on in the last two weeks is, I think, going to accelerate things. I don't think people really understand quite uh, quite yet how how quickly things can change um, once you have this bifurcation on the international level of, of monetary systems because it seems like Russia, China, other BRIC countries are going to begin hedging their economies against the, uh, the dollar system, seeing what's going on with the sanctions and yeah it's I think the second half of 2022 is going to be, wild in terms of what goes on on the international stage and, and how Bitcoin performs in that in that environment. Well, it, it's wild to see a country firstly get cancelled. <laughs> like, like, right? like, what do you think about the the Chelsea owner like being forced to to sell? <clears throat> yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. And as ever, I'm going to go straight down the middle and deviate to both sides. Right. <laughs> so. Firstly, because um, there's lots of bits you can talk about with this, and I wonder where we agree or disagree on this stuff. But uh, firstly, the, I think your starting point has to be like, what well, has to be for me is like, wh why, to, to, to think about Roman Abr Abramovich, I have to think about why has this war happened and is there any justification? And, and usually I come to no because I struggle to justify any war. I mean, I, I think you can justify World War II. Um, I think you can justify. Was it uh, Viet? Was it Vietnam? He went to Cambodia during Pol, Pol Pot when he was basically murdering everyone. Was it uh, Vietnam? That wasn't Vietnam. No. No. Who who entered? But who, no. Who went? Not in the Vietnam War. Who entered into Cambodia to defend? Mm. I think I thought it was the Vietnamese who went in there. But anyway, like there's certain things you can go. Okay, I understand that. Um, I used to think that the Balkans War that was justified, but actually I. I think it was Scott Horton I hear talk, talk about that and explain actually what was happening. Perhaps that should have been reconsidered. I'm, I'm, I don't know enough to talk about it. But I, when you start trying to dive into the weeds of why this has happened, you can you can kind of guess or see there's different people explaining different reasons. Um, is Putin trying to defend Russia from Nazi bat battalion of 800 people and demilitarize it, or is it? You know, a justified defense of the borders by having neutral countries. I, I don't know, but I, I struggle to ever justify a war, and I didn't feel like we're at the point where a full invasion of a sovereign current country was necessary. So if that's happening, it's like, is there a duty to protect Ukraine? Is there a duty to get involved? And if so, what duty? I certainly think you. We might agree that the U.S. and the U.K. getting involved in some kind of military conflict would be a terrible escalation. Yeah, that would not be good. And we, so we have to accept what's happening. But like, should the West be doing anything? Like, you, you have to start from the point of, do, or I have to start from the point. Do I think what Russia is doing is wrong? And I, I do. I don't know if what you, if you do. Yeah. Well, it goes back. Like I tweeted. We had a little. You responded to a tweet I sent last week, where it's like, and people may not like to hear this, but Russia and China. Have been playing long-term games behind the scenes. I disagree with you, didn't I? Yes. Well, the yeah. U.S. But I, I think we, after you dis, we disagreed in 280 characters, but I think yeah. we have a discussion about it. We, we can come to an agreement where basically what I said was 
Russia and China are playing long-term games and they're beating the West. Like the West is here in the United States. We're worried about whether or not soldiers are putting their genders in their bios and like worrying about woke politics at at the military level. We're very distracted and focusing on things, whether it be in the military or in the broader economy, that that is being a a significant detriment to, uh, I would argue, the safety, security, and ability for us to to actually compete on the global scale, um, where China and Russia are playing long-term games, China especially, but Russia has been playing a long-term game as well. If you look at their gold stockpiles over the last two decades, they've actively been accumulating as much gold as possible. China, similarly, they've been dumping U.S. treasuries behind the scenes, both of them, um, even though China still has a lot of treasuries, they have been hedging away from that. And then this, this has been going on for decades. And what I mean, I don't, I'm not saying that their long-term strategies are good for their, their citizens or the world at large, but you, you have to recognize that they, they have been playing long-term games. And Russia specifically has been playing a long-term game where they've been accumulating gold and they've been trying to shift the balance of power in their part of the world by getting the, the Western countries over in Europe Getting Europe, specifically the UK, and some parts of the United States, uh, dependent on their resources. Yeah. And so, and they've waged. That's the thing. They've been playing long-term, uh, like psychological operation games too. They've they've invested in uh, campaigns, media campaigns, and NGO campaigns to besmirch natural gas and nuclear proliferation in, in Europe and in the West. Mm. And at the same time, they're drilling for, for natural gas and accumulating a lot of hard assets and commodities that the rest of the world is dependent on while we're over here in the West complain, like wondering whether or not you should call somebody you know, he, she, it, or they. Like, and we're just bickering amongst ourselves while these two rising powers, China more specifically, and more more of a threat than Russia, I would, I would argue, um, are, are playing these long-term games and positioning themselves to to have a lot of leverage over the West, and they've successfully mm. done that. And so, to your point, like, what can we do as the West? No, I don't think we should enter this conflict at all. What we should do is recognize that we've been getting played pretty, like, we, we've been played like a fiddle by Russia and China in a lot of regards, and they've successfully convinced us to to make our our countries less secure particularly with via energy policy um so you you could make a very strong argument i would i believe this wholeheartedly if if russia didn't have as much control over europe's fuel source with via natural gas and their food source via wheat and fertilizer produced by natural gas byproducts then they probably wouldn't have invade, had the confidence to invade ukraine because they wouldn't have any leverage on, on the back end of that invasion. And um, now we're seeing gas prices in Europe yeah. go through the roof. Yeah. I mean, my, my, um, my power bill came in one month and it had tripled. Yeah, it's it's fucking tripled. Yeah. I mean, I'm fine, I can afford it, but like a lot of people are going to be looking at yeah. going, holy shit, I can't heat my home. But, but anyway, beside the point, it's like, yeah, no, I mean, I, mean, I completely agree with you on, on that. Um, but it's the, the point I get to is, should the West do anything to def- defend the Ukraine is any of the actions that they've taken to try and build leverage. And I come at like at two different points. I'm like, okay, perhaps they should because they should help the Ukraine. They are a sovereign nation that's been attacked. But does it really harm the right people? It doesn't make a difference. Like we know with sanctions, they just never work. Yeah. They just harm the people. They never harm the leaders. So like, is that worth doing? I, I don't know. And the problem is, is the West has typically gone completely fucking overboard with this. I think forms of like financial pressure you can debate, but when I see the Russian driver for the Haas F1 team removed from the team because he's Russian, I just see that as completely and utterly wrong. He's he's a racing car driver. It's yeah. not his fucking fault. Yeah. And when I see a film festival ban Russian films, I just see that's cultural censorship. And I don't think that achieves it. That makes me that flips me to want to like defend Russia now. Right. Say, hey, this is bullshit. Yeah, it's it's like BLM all over. You remember during the BLM protests, whereby the protests, the movement itself was kind of weird, but at the same time, you, it did make me want to research and understand if there are any kind of uh, ingrained kind of 
unfair pressures on black communities. I wanted to learn about it, but at the same time, the whole movement just became weird and every day you would get like five emails from people who are on their mailing list telling you their Black Lives Matters policy. Now it's like everyone's got their Russia policy. Yeah. But it's a policy of just complete cancelling. And I'm not... So when we look at that, I, I go, I don't agree with removing film festivals. I don't agree with removing a, a racing car driver. Uh, do I agree with certain financial pressures? I think I do. So then you thought you say about Roman Abramovich, like targeting the oligarchs. I mean, they're essentially just taking money from these people. But then the point of view I come up with the oligarchs is I think these are, it's essentially a mafia organization and the head of the mafia is Putin in one way. And these people have, there's a really great uh, podcast series on Audible about the background of the oligarchs and they essentially pillage the nation. Then they took the money out of Russia. They haven't returned it to the Russian people. And so is that ill-gotten gains? Is it actually justified to, uh, you know, seize this money? I don't know. I'm really kind of like, I can see an argument for, an argument against. But if if you do seize it, are you going to return it to the Russians? Yeah, exactly. Are you going to Robin Hood this back as an airdrop back to the Russians? No. That, so I don't know. I'm like, I'm split on it. I, I think what it does, it highlights that that, for me, it's a very similar scenario to the Canadian truckers. What we're getting is these different pockets around the world that are highlighting, it doesn't matter who you are or where you are, your assets can be seized. Whether you're a Russian billionaire, a Canadian trucker, you know, somebody raising money, somebody just raising money for truckers. Whoever you are, you can have your money seized at any point. And everybody should be scared of that. Yeah, I mean, world capital is, is creeping into everything and even war now, which yeah. is... What do you think of t sanctions or pr the kind of pressures that have been put on Russia and targeting oligarchs? Do you fundamentally disagree with it or do you see an argument for it? Uh, yeah, I think I fundamentally disagree just because, like you said, like what are they going to do, seize the money and then airdrop it back to the Russian citizens? No. And so I think, like, what do we do going forward? It's very hard to do. And again, I'm not a geopolitical or political science expert, but if it were me, again, like I, I really... I really like Jocko Willock's theory of extreme ownership or his, his mantra of extreme ownership. Like what we should do, I don't think we should do anything retroactively. We should just assess the situation as it is now. Look, we've gotten to a point where we antagonized Russia. We allowed them to develop an insane amount of leverage by acquiring an, uh, energy at, or producing energy assets while convincing the West to, to not produce them. We should recognize that we fucked up and try to de-escalate. Like, I think that's the thing that I think President Biden was completely irresponsible last week when he said you have two option sanctions or World War Three. Like, Wait, that's, hold on, there's a third one. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a let's meet at the table and, okay, even though we don't like you as an autocratic dictator, Vladimir Putin, we do recognize that you don't want military bases, United States, UN, NATO military bases uh, right on your border with, with guns pointed at you and your people. We will agree to back off and separate uh, and not approach Ukraine to, to join NATO or the EU will respect your wishes uh, in that regard. Um, and then you can de-escalate the situation. Then from there, it's like, okay, we, we still don't like that Putin's a dictator, he's an autocrat, and he's uh, jailing people, poisoning dissidents, poisoning uh, political opponents. Murdering and, journalists. Murdering <laughs> journalists and stuff like that. But uh, we to avoid direct conflict, we should um, reduce his leverage by making ourselves as energy independent and secure as possible and basically allowing free markets to, to solve the problem of, of the amount of leverage that has been, uh, been thrown towards Russia and China's way. I mean, China, like, that's the other thing too. If you, if you get into this, if you get into an escalation, like China's going to get dragged in too. And that's, a very scary proposition that yeah. everybody should be actively and ardently trying to avoid. Um, but I, the sad thing is I don't have faith that the U S or European nations, the, the NATO nations are going to be able to do this. These people at the end of the day, whether it be the U S government, the French government, the UK government, the politicians, it's what, what you have is the people of you, it's an extremely sad situation. The people of Ukraine, the people of Russia, and if we get dragged into this, the people of the West, 
the citizens, me and you, we're, we're just pawns in a, a proxy war between sociopathic kleptocrats who are just in a big dick measuring contest. And we all, well, that's, that's the thing about uh, Russia as well. It's like 144 million people have just seen their, that's, you know, their savings yeah, it's, eviscerated over the last week. Yeah, it's an extremely slippery slope. Like, yeah. what, like, I mean, it's, it may seem bombastic, but like, you're watching the West turn into somewhat of Nazis right now. Like I saw videos of, of in Germany, like Germans throwing bricks through Russian supermarkets. And well, what does that remind you of? That, that's like that's like a, uh, a callback to pre World War Two when yeah, the, the night of the broken glass. Yeah. They're just painting the Jews as dirty people and yeah. besmirching them. It's, I mean, it's, again, like average Russian citizens have nothing to do with this, like you said. And it's just, I, I think it's extremely irresponsible the response that the West has, has had to this particular situation. It's all incredibly sad. It's just like, but again, it's the citizens, the Russian citizens, the Ukrainian citizens are all just bypassers in a proxy war of, of people who will never see the battlefield, who would never themselves pick up a gun and, and go to the front lines. Um, they might have to. I, I'm sure I saw a thing in Russia, like if you are caught uh, spreading misinformation, you have to go and join the army. Apparently. like <laughs> Is that true, Danny? <laughs> apparently, they were like 50% of the Russian army was conscripted um, well, recently. I think, I think that's why they've struggled uh you know with their with their invasion it's not been like the, the clean kind of easy take because there's inexperienced soldiers on the front line. Yeah. it's like fuck man i mean it's saying you go to there's jail time if you is it 15 years yeah but i guess maybe they can then put an incentive like you don't have to go to jail if you join the army yeah <laughs> fuck man it's weird it's weird. i tell you another thing that's come out of this whole situation which is um i wonder how you feel about this because uh i'm very quick to get an opinion on things and then usually have to walk them back. Uh, and trying to find truth at the moment is really, really hard. And that's impacted me in a way I don't know if it impacts you in that I feel a sense of responsibility in the content we create because uh, I've been very critical of large media organizations and corporate media and uh, in, the, in the way they kind of like disseminate bullshit. Um, but at the same time, I'm also then like, fuck, am I doing the same sometimes? I really, it's like it really plays on me. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, it's sovereign individual thesis is playing yeah. out. Like as we get further into the digital age, excuse me, it's, it's going to be harder to discern the, the signal from the noise and you have to f develop as an individual your, your own facilities to filter all the information and, and try to define what is signal and noise for you. And so for me... Uh, in this particular situation with Russia, Ukraine, and the rest of the world, it's going into it knowing that the mainstream media has their propaganda, Russia has their propaganda, and just trying the best I can to find individuals on the ground who are are giving pure information and not the the lens that not trusting the, the information via the lens of, of the mainstream corporate media or Russia's propaganda arms as well. Have you found any good sources? I, I got, um, I got a telegram group from a Miles Suter thread. Yeah, there's a, I don't know the exact name, but yeah, there's, there's a Russian, um, telegram channel where they're giving their perspective. And that was actually pretty helpful the other night at the nuclear power facility where, Zelensky and everybody was like, oh, they're attacking a nuclear power facility. But in that telegram group, it was they made it pretty apparent and obvious that the Ukrainian army retreated there specifically to create a, a scene. And then they fired an RPG first and there was a fire, but it was nowhere near the actual nuclear reactor. It was at a training facility on, on the property. And See, that's a perfect example where I reacted quickly. I take a Sky News headline. I'm like, you bet, Lens, what are you doing? I was like, fuck, what have I done? <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah, that's the, uh, I don't trust <clears throat> any, any of the, the corporate media anymore, especially after COVID. And do, you, do you watch any of it, though, or do you just ignore it? I ignore it. I'll see clips on, on Twitter and watch those. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely. I mean, 
But I was on Tucker Carlson the uh, the other week. It was funny. Like with, with no shoes, no shoes, barefoot. But I was yeah, I was in the uh, production man. I only watched twenty minutes of it. It was like the ten minutes before or the fifteen minutes before I went on, and then the five minutes I was on for that segment I was on. But like even just like watching the ten minutes before, I was like, oh my, like, and I probably agree with Tucker on a lot of things, and I think he does better than some at, at giving a different perspective on that stage. But even so, like just the whole format of that type of news vehicle is like, oh my god, how do people watch this? It's that's why we've had the rise of independence. Yes, like yourself, myself, and that's where I think. Yeah, that's where I think we can get better information. This long form stuff. I mean, Rogan obviously changed the game with the change the game. With the long form but, it, stuff. but even in some of that, like it's um, I th- I feel like audience capture and corporate media are two prob- two sides of the same coin. I th- I think there's certain like I don't think Rogan. I think Rogan's great. I think he tries to see both sides and admits when he's wrong. Um, but I think there are people out there who are victims of audience capture, and I think that's to me that's almost as big as a problem as. What do you mean by audience capture? <clears throat> like, uh, putting things out that they know their audience will love oh, yeah. without thinking it through. I think Tim Paul does it a lot, mm-hmm. um, and I think that that it's not like a it's not like a balanced approach. Like I, if I listen to you, I I, I feel like. I won't always agree with you because I'm, you know, the reason why I'm in the show, I come from a different perspective, but I believe you believe what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But like, I think some people out there, they will just constantly replay ideas just to keep getting the likes, the retweets, get them on their show because they, there's an economic benefit to growing your social media audience. Yes. Because that sends them to your podcast or your YouTube and that drives ads. And I think audience capture can be as just as, just as bad as corporate media. Yeah. And I, that's what I worry about. Yeah. Bad incentive seeking into media exists. That's why, I, again, we got to give a shout out to Adam Carey, what he's trying to yeah. bring to the market, or what he has brought to the market, podcasting 2.0 and the value for value model. And I think that creates better aligned incentives and something I would like to transition to full time. When I've tried to sell subscriptions or get people to pay for the podcast, it's like a few dollars. And I know it's like long term, you want to get to there, but it's. Mm-hmm. It's so far away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm set up on it. I'm. You can probably look at my phone. There's probably people streaming sats, but compared to the ad revenue, it's it's a pittance at this point in yeah. time. And I think that's uh, a product of just the stage of Bitcoin adoption that we're in, and awareness of the ability to do it in and of itself. Uh, I do think it could get there potentially in the future. I mean, the No Agenda show has proven that that it does work. I do wonder at scale with many podcasts doing like are people going to be paying value for value across all their content uh, consumption. Yeah. Unless we get Spotify deals. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love a $200 million Spotify deal. <laughs> but yeah, they, like, that whole um, truth finding is, like I say, it's got that both sides for me, Marty. And not only in, am I constantly reflecting on stuff I put out there because I'm like, shit, am I part of the problem? Um, but I'm also having that difficulty in just finding signal from noise and yeah. reacting too quick. Yeah. And I've always been a fan of me personally, what I do with the newsletter, the podcast, or just being upfront with the audience. Like, here's my biases. Um, bullish on Bitcoin. I think we should be transitioning to a Bitcoin standard. So my content is going to um, highlight um, news and events that are, that are getting, closer, getting us closer to that. Top that, I, I like to be critical of Bitcoin too, and highlight where pain points and uh, inefficiencies and shortfalls exist. Um, I like to think that I am not just like a full-on Bitcoin cheerleader, but I'm realistic about what's going on. But yeah, that's where, where are the pain points now for you? Uh, I mean, Bitcoin's most centralized at the ASIC chip level. I mean, we can't have. TSMC and Samsung being particularly located in Taiwan and South Korea being the only chip producers for the Bitcoin mining industry. I do think that is getting more distributed and the prospect of foundries coming to Texas and Arizona is, is very encouraging. Intel entering the game is very encouraging. Um, How much, because you're, you're in the mining game more than me. How much do we know about the Intel chip? Uh, just specs at this point. Uh, I'm not sure. They're 
Yeah, they now yeah, they, so they announced their specs like last week at a conference. We know that Block, formerly Square, mm-hmm. has a, a big order in with them. Grid um, that just went public via spec. They have a big order in with them. So there, there is at least uh, a couple reputable companies out there that are yes, we feel confident enough that that we're going to build or excuse me buy large amounts of of these ASICs, uh, and as they're being marketed as extremely more power efficient. So that people are describing them as, and cheaper. So um, people are describing them as like the Toyota Camry or Honda Civic of the mining industry, where um, they may not be producing insane amount of terahash per second, like the top of the line bit mains or micro BTs, but uh, they're extremely more efficient on the power draw and, and cheaper. So therefore more accessible to your, your, your average Joe. But again, I'm always highly skeptical of the free talk, um, pre-launch talk of these computers. There's been a lot of... Dude, I brought 70 Dragomans. Yeah. Fucking things. Yeah, right. <laughs> they, delayed and then completely obsoleted. Uh, you know what? I, uh, at the same time, I bought 70 S9s and then I ended up giving up mining. They sat in a crate for like two years and then I ended up selling the S9s. I got something like... Well, Six seven hundred dollars in S nine at yeah, some point. It's a good price. And then it was well, it was when the Bitcoin price was first went over like fifty thousand, mm. and I think I got thirty each for the Dragon. <laughs> <It's like, laughs> fucking piece of shit. <laughs> That's um, let's talk about mining stuff actually, because uh, this there is an area that we definitely differ on is environmental concerns. I think we differ here mm-hmm. in that. Um, I, I'm i definitely in a space where I worry about the environment. I think there are problems. I, I think you think they're overstated. Am I right or am I wrong? Yes, I think I think we've been psyop to believe that humans are, are bad and they shouldn't be using energy where I, I think the exact opposite. Humans are good. We should be using as much energy as possible. I agree with that. Uh, it's more that uh, burning fossil fuels is bad for the environment. And the reason I've come from that point is just... I've spent a lot of time interviewing people who are environmental scientists and stuff, and, and every single one who tell uh, I did one yesterday with uh, Do you know Margot Pyers? I don't think so. She wrote. Um, don't I think I think you would differ from her even more than me. She's pretty left, um, but she's uh, she's a climate scientist. I have interviewed Catherine Hayhoe in Lubbock uh, here in Texas, and they they've all they're all the same. They're like, no, this is this is a problem. Um, my my thing isn't that I think we need some big centralized government response to this, which would be abused and probably dumb and um, and uh, would probably not work because we know how bad governments are at these big problems. But I still think it's an issue, and I I don't know if we're in the world of considering mitigation for climate issues, like how we plan for it. Or whether there does need to be something that does to, to, to you know, protect us from the environment, like investment in certain technologies. But do you actually think there's no issue? Do you think there's a climate issue? I mean, I mean well, that's like the whole thing. Like, what is a climate? Like, it's this whole thing. On well, a warming planet that has yeah, implications. I mean, the, the, the climate is warming, the world is warming, but we're also coming out of an ice age. And what you'll find is that it, it's warming in the coldest spots, like, uh, from what I understand, which is. Which is not necessarily a bad thing. It helps green the earth. Um, and yeah, I, I again, like having done a bunch of research, having had climate um, scientists on myself, Steve Coonan being one of them, who dove into all the IPCC data or IPPC. Was, was Coonan was he the guy who was on Rogan recently? Yeah, he was on. Uh, he's from. He was. A, he's a professor at NYU. Yeah. And I, yeah, I just think there's a lot of data manipulation in. All, all the climate change stuff is based off of four projecting models that have proven time and time and time again to be wrong. So that's one, again, just using heuristics, these people in, in the 70s, there was going, we were going into an ice age. In the 80s, the ozone layer was going to, problem was going to destroy humanity. In the 90s, acid raid was going to destroy the world. And then in the 21st century, for the first two decades, uh, climate change, uh, global warming has been the big boogeyman. I just don't. 
think it's happening um, the, to, the, to the extent. I don't think there's going to be a, a catastrophe that wipes out humanity. Humans are extremely adaptable and um, we are part of nature. And we've, we've, we've learned how to harness nature to protect ourselves against uh, nature itself, uh, which is an incredible feat for, for, for an animal to do on this planet, for, an, for a species, for society to do. And I think there are like a lot of the problems that climate scientists and uh, hysterics will point to, particularly around like droughts and like uh, soil conditions. I don't think that has to do with, with climate problems, but just the way we're, we're attacking those those particular ecosystems. Like we should really be getting into regenerative farming, ra- grazing, roaming cattle that that help green the earth. We should really be focusing on not creating monocultures in soil um, and make sure that we're replenishing and mixing in different crops and stuff like that uh, and creating ecosystems that, that create the, the capabilities for, for a vibrant um, ecosystem to thrive. I think this is definitely the area we disagree on. <laughs> uh, okay, that's fair. I mean, I'm not going to get into the debate. The, um, but the global cooling stuff in the 70s, that was that was the Michael Mann article that was based on. It all comes from that article. And he's debunked that himself and said his model yeah. was wrong. The models, yeah. the models, the models. Yeah. The models are always wrong. No, and I agree with the idea, like, modeling this stuff is super difficult. Um, but I, I would be in defense of the ozone issue from the 80s, because policy did change in terms of CSCs and fridges and aerosol cans and you know, policy change protected us from the ozone. Go on, <laughs> give me that look. You give me I that mean, look. They, they, can, they can go back and retroactively be like, look, we changed our policy and the things changed, but I don't, I don't think that that is the case. Well, we, we can agree to disagree, but like, so do you think there's, there's no requirement to, to have... I mean, I know you you fucking hate the ESG stuff. I mean, ESG is communistic bullshit, so. <laughs> <laughs> but you can see. So it's a, one of those things that's probably not going to go away. No, no, we're going to destroy ESG. Tell, tell me how. I mean, it's it's led us to the situation that we have right now. Like it's literally, you can argue that ESG mandates and uh, investment styles have led us to a position where Russia is able to invade Ukraine, because we've virtue signaled and LARPed about the environment and shifted all the leverage over to Russia. And then on top of that, you can't, ESG is trying to create a a metric system for an amorphous uh, landscape, which is subjective ideas on what is important in the world. Like different societies, different individuals have different perspectives on what is good for themselves, their local communities, their states, their countries, like to trying to create a a fine fitted metric system of ESG scores that sort of define whether or not you're you're a good citizen or company is completely asinine. And mm-hmm. it's again a lot of the problems that exist in this world today are the fact that you have centralized systems, which ESG is via capital allocation, trying to granularly control complex systems like economies, environments, monetary systems, whatever it may be. Who, yeah. who's, who was that ESG guy? Is it Larry, Larry Fink? Mm-hmm. He's yeah, the guy who started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I, I just see it. I see it like it's just he's created this narrative that allows him to. Yeah. Pick the the next investment products, allocate the capital. Yeah, to, BlackRock's yeah. the biggest asset manager on the planet. They have yeah. trillions of dollars under management, and they're leading this ESG charge. And but but I, you you say you'll be destroyed. I I don't see it going away yet. It's we're going to destroy ESG. Don't okay, worry. it's going to take time, but it is. We're going to you ridicule it. It's it's literally making humanity worse off, and it's and it's hypocritical. Right, like, there was a Bloomberg article last week. Like, oh, are these arm dealers actually ESG for giving I for sending that, for sending dude. guns to Ukrainian citizens? Like, it's, like, it's it's a clown world yeah. concept. Like, it, it completely it, it's completely asinine on its face because again, you're you're trying to measure and create a metric system for subjective concepts. Like, what is good? What what is moral? What is ethical? And uh 
in, throughout different societies and different economies and different localities, different companies, different industries, whatever it may be. What do you, what do you think about like investing in renewables as part of the mix? Do you just think just use whichever energy is the cheapest or do you think there is value in investing in wind, solar, hydro, even if it's maybe not well, as efficient, well, but like it's greener. Do you think that's something well, that's, we should be Well, that's that whole, like again, like now we're like, what is green? What is green? Well, let, let's, because there's two areas of green. It's like one is like the production and waste that comes from it. That's a certain area which is bad for the environment. Like if you're creating these big wind farms that have a certain time period and then you've got all this waste, totally get that. But then there's, if you are somebody who thinks that there is an issue with burning fossil fuels and carbon in the atmosphere and that is warming the planet. You might not, but like, you know, I do. If we're investing, like we have that trade-off, okay, we have the e-waste that comes of this, but we do get to reduce carbons. Is that like a worthy investment? No, because it doesn't actually reduce carbon. Like the amount, like you can look into this, like there's, again, starting on the front end of the supply chain to create solar panels or coal panels. You need coal. You can only, the only thing you can get hot enough to create Solar panels is coal. So you need to burn coal on the front of that supply chain. Uh, and then once you get the solar panel up, again, it's intermittent. It is unreliable. So like when the sun doesn't shine, it's not producing uh, electricity. So to back that up, you typically need natural gas power plants to su supplement that that uh, solar energy when it's not producing electricity. And what you'll find is turning those natural gas power plants on and off is actually worse, producing more CO2 emissions if you care about them than just setting up a natural gas power plant in and of itself and keeping it on 24-7. So like supplementing that solar panel set up with a, a natural gas plant behind it and turning that natural gas plant on and off when the solar panel isn't, electric, isn't producing electricity, you turn it on. Uh, when it starts producing electricity, you turn it off and that turn off startup mode actually produces a lot of CO2. And then on the back end of... The supply chain these things have uh, very short useful lives and then they need to be recycled and it takes <laughs> toxic chemicals uh, to to do so and then going back to when it is up and running it, these are massive structures like the amount of land needed to produce the same amount of energy or electricity that could be produced by a well pad uh, a natural gas well pad is significantly um, more vast and, and then you have the the conversation about oh, you have these solar panels that are just thrust in these environments and they're blocking the sun from getting to the ground and destroying the environment below that so there's like many intricacies and then going back to the front end of the supply chain the polysilicon that, that allows us to create these these solar panels the cheapest polysilicon in the world is handcrafted by Uyghur slaves in China. And so what does that do for your ESG score? You don't care about the slavery on yeah, the but front But they don't end. count. Yeah. And then you They're get, not Americans. Yeah. And then you get into the wind turbines too. It means a significant amount of cobalt, most of which is uh, mined excavated. Mined by children. Yeah, mined by children in the Congo. It gets comp and, and then it feels good uh, because it's quote unquote cleaner when it's actually producing electricity because you don't see all the stuff happening on the front and back end of the supply chain. And then it, it's a worse product. Like Humanity has only uh, created step function improvements in our quality of life and our ability to create things and become more productive when we find denser, cheaper forms of energy. Like Transitioning to wind, solar, and hydro is a regression because they're mm -hmm. less dense and less reliable. Like we are going to progress. We should be going towards nuclear. And this is another thing. These people don't care about the environment. If they did, they I would agree be, on nuclear. They would be pushing yeah. nuclear. Like these the, the I wholeheartedly believe uh, you think I'm crazy, a tinfoil hat wearing uh, conspiracy theorist or an Alex Jones like character, like I completely believe that the whole climate hysteria is nothing more than a massive propaganda campaign to force us onto less reliable energy um, infrastructure that allows the kleptocratic sociopaths that are getting us in this proxy war at the moment uh, to have more control over us. Like if you have abundant, cheap, dense energy, uh, people are able to do better things with their lives and support themselves 
Uh, they don't need the government. They don't need the state. They don't need the technocracy to. Would you say a good example of this is we've had this massive rise in energy prices in the UK, uh, and I saw recently in Scotland. Can you look this up in Scotland? Mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure the Scottish government is now having to subsidise people's energy bills. Like, yeah, they're going to have to. I mean, it's. I think I saw that as well. It's not going to work though. Like, this is going to create inflation. It's going to create more centralized control. Um, and yeah, like it's. Do, do, do you honestly believe like it's uh, it's this kind of like these policy decisions are to create control? Or do you think it's, is it more just like incompetence? It's probably a combination. I mean, because I struggle to think like I struggle to think they're that coordinated, and I struggle to think there's a group of people sat around a table making. I I, I would always uh, on the side of it, this is probably just fucking incompetence. No, nah, I mean, but then you, okay, I go back and forth. It's probably a combination of both is what I settle on because yeah. you see things emanating from the World Economic Forum like Build Back Better and then you see Macron, Biden, Kamala Harris, Nancy Pelosi, even Donald Trump, uh, uh, Christine Lagarde, politicians, mm-hmm. Jacinda, like all saying Build Back Better at the same time. Then we have this Build Back Better bill here in the United States. Like There is some form of centralized messaging control that that is emanating and what is the world economics forum forum's goal i don't again i do think they're incompetent i think they're sloppy i think they're going to lose but i do think they had this intention they they want you to own nothing and be happy with it they want to control uh, the the way you live your life and uh, again the, the large uh, lever to to garner more control is is making people less energy secure if, if you were in your most charitable opinion what what do you think the role of the World Economic Forum is? It's just a circle jerk for rich people who are completely disconnected from. And that's your most generous <laughs> charitable version. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Honestly, it's yeah. just disconnected people who think they're you know, are rich and therefore think that they um, know what's best for for everybody in the world, even though they probably a lot of them. Uh, garner their riches uh, via luck and just riding a, an incredible um, trend in in monetary policy and market structure that, that really afforded them a bit of luck to, in terms of acquiring their riches. Um, but that's the most charitable. I do think some of these people are legitimately evil and sociopathic and get pleasure out of making people eat bugs and wear masks and shit like that. Charles Schwab. <laughs> yeah. Um, we should uh, spend some time looking at that uh, production of solar panels. And yeah, I did try and uh, I, saw, I saw the most fucking stupid fact check. Uh, so I looked at the um, coal needed to produce solar panels and it was myth busted. Uh, but the myth bus was, yeah, but we might not need to use it in the future. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's, that's not a myth bus. No, that's not a myth bus. So yeah. I, I mean, it looks like that's true. Okay, we should look into that. And the reason we should look into that, I did this interview. Do you know this guy, Troy Cross? Yes, yes, we've gone back and forth on Twitter before. In good or uh, we do not agree with you. Do not agree with us <laughs> because he. Uh, I interviewed him and he had he has this. You, do you know his concept, his idea? I know he's like a philosopher, yeah. like really passionate about renewables. But. Well, he wants to flip the ESG narrative by making investment in green mining. There's no such thing as green mining. I'm just. But there is See, in the I've, I've, there is in the eyes of the people who are pushing ESG. Yeah, and those people are dumb, and we should not cater to dumb people. Like they they again, they're trying to manipulate. It's, it's coming from the finance world where you just have these buzzword portfolios. Like ESG is just another buzzword portfolio that people middlemen uh, are trying to take advantage of. Like it's just it's nothing more. Than an investing meme that portfolio managers are trying to eke out more expenses from. It does not lead to better investment. It does not lead to better outcomes. And it, it does not lead to a better world. And I will work my hardest to destroy ESG. I'm sorry, Troy. <laughs> well, no, no, no. I mean, I always want to know. Because I'm. I'm... And I, say, I press Troy on it. Like, what is green? Like, again, it's, it's a lot of propaganda. Like, define green for me. Why? I think it's what's considered renewable. Well, what is renewable? What is renewable? Well, it, so if, that is if, another thing. Like, what is the definition of the word renewable? It feels like one of the it's words hard. matter. What Definitions about, of words matter. Does, does does hydro count? Can we? Can we? No, we can't even have hydro. No, because hydro, you need to destroy a whole environment and, and to to actually make it possible. Well, 
we need to because we did the interview with Troy and I also spoke to Nick Carter about it and I know you like Nick. Yeah, uh, Nick and I are good friends. Yeah. We also disagree on this. Yeah, you um, also disagree on this. So we've got Troy and Nick coming in to discuss it. So we we kind of have to do our research on this and mm-hmm. and put it back at them, which I will do. Um, you probably want to, if you don't mind, send me some resources to help me. Yeah, plan for that because uh, I'm. As I said to you earlier, I said to you earlier, like I'm really conscious of am I putting out information that's bad and i'm not saying i agree with you i'm just saying well if what you're saying is right it's like oh shit well maybe molly is right well, well just but what about troy's idea just to play within the framework of what corporations need to do right now like rather than buying shit carbon credits that don't even do anything is is increasing bitcoin mining not a better solution than that i don't again like this is how like how what do you mean by increasing bitcoin just increasing so, so he's got the, his his concept is like bringing a bunch of ideas together um, in that he used the Winklevoss as an example. They uh, wanted to offset their uh, emissions, so they invested a bunch of money into some kind of carbon credit. Wait, well, which, to be fair, he said were very like good credits. Yeah, were good credits. He, <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. I do okay. yeah. find good credits. Uh, and actually, Margot, who we had in here yesterday, is completely against the carbon system, the credit system, because all that does is it allows people to export their higher emissions to other countries. It's just it's bullshit. But his idea is that you can you can grow Bitcoin, you can grow Bitcoin awareness, you can bring a bunch of companies money into Bitcoin by using ESG as a narrative for getting people to invest in green mining. So forget whether you agree with it or not for the second Marty, but the idea being is all these companies who've got these trillions of or billions of dollars locked up that needs to go into ESG, you can turn around to them and say, well, if you do, if you mine here with uh, this, what we call green mining, not only are you um, offsetting your emissions, but you're also getting a Bitcoin return for it. And he he basically said, like, you figure out the percentage of Bitcoin that you own of the 21 million, and then you contribute that percentage of the hash rate using renewable energy. Yeah, go for it. Go for it if you want to, but just don't force me to do it. I, 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 he doesn't I, want to force anyone. Well, I hope I hope people go for that because, like, mining on solar or wind again, these are intermittent energy sources. As somebody who's going and buying natural gas wells around the country to mine Bitcoin with, I would love that because <laughs> it would make me better off with other miners using less reliable energy sources that makes their operations uh, less reliable as a result. Like, and but at the end of the day, again, Troy, what is green? What is renewable? I've pressed you on uh, about this on Twitter and you've, you've failed to give me a, a, an actual response. Like it, I'm going to put your question and, to him. And, and this is all a massive LARP because as much as people want to talk about like wanting to use solar and wanting to use wind and going down the, 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 the clean and renewable path, when push comes to shove, when the Texas grid, blacks out when people's energy prices hit uh, 50 cents a kilowatt hour, a dollar a kilowatt hour soon in Western Europe, they're going to want natural gas and they're going to want reliable energy sources. Like look at what Ger- yeah. Germany has transitioned to renewables. Again, renewable is a propaganda term that doesn't make any sense over the last 20 years. And they have the highest uh, electricity cost per kilowatt hour in, in the developed world. And that is a regressive tax on poor people. Like think about what we're telling Africa and, and s- parts of South America. Like, oh, we the Western world have built ourselves up to to these massive economies using uh, petro, using uh, Petrocar- hydrocar- hydrocarbons. hydrocarbons. Yeah. Uh, but we've gotten to a point where big, you know what? Now we're like comfortable. You're not allowed to use those because it's not ESG conscious. You're not allowed to pull yourself up out of poverty by leveraging coal, natural gas, oil. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we need to to solve this climate climate crisis that these models have told us is coming. Uh, it's, it's it's anti-human. It's it's actually anti-poor people. It's racist, and it's going to make the world worse off. Well, I don't I don't think what you're saying is conspiratorial. I, I, if it's fact based, it's just the facts. Well, look, let's get to the facts too. Like people want to LARP about this, and they want to uh, opine about becoming cleaner. But like California is a perfect example. There's an incredible gentleman. Maybe you should get him on the show. Mike Umbro. He's an oil producer in California. And he's on, I need to get him on TFTC first, but 
Right. You, hey, listen, you know, you know I'm, I'm yeah. loyal no, no, to chronology. No, I know, I know. If, if somebody comes first, I, I never step but, away. But he's an oil producer in California, and he's been on this incredible campaign. He's got videos on LinkedIn and Twitter that basically highlights the hypocrisy of, of California particularly. So California is one of the largest economies in the world, separate from the United States, obviously one of the largest economies in the United States. Maybe it's faltered in the last couple of years because people have been exited, exiting the state. But they they... I believe the demand for oil in California is like 600 million barrels a year and only increasing. Despite that, uh, the the ability for California oil producers within the state to actually bring that supply to market is significantly uh, hindered by government regulations. We're like, no, this is dirty oil. We're, we're not going to let you... Uh, we're not going to let you extract it here in the state of California and deliver it to our market. Like you, you can only, there's very tight restrictions on how much oil can be pulled out of the ground in California. Despite that, the demand for oil is still there. So what you see is that California oil producers who produce arguably the cleanest barrel, there's the least likelihood for spills, there's the least likelihood for uh, methane emissions via the natural gas side of things. Uh, they're not allowed to bring their relatively clean barrel of oil to market, yet California still has the same amount of demand, and they import it from Russia, from Ecuador, and they import it on tankers that, that travel h- hundreds of miles across the sea, have a high likelihood for spills, use diesel fuel to, to make that journey. They've, they're virtue signaling that they, they don't want to produce oil in their state, but they still consume the same amount of oil, and they just import it from other countries that have worse regulations on the ground when they're p- pulling it out of the ground. They're putting it on ships, shipping it over using diesel fuel and increasing the likelihood of, of oil spills in the ocean. Whereas if they were to actually extract it in California and allow themselves to deliver it to their market and supply their own demand, uh, it would go through a pipeline. It would be extracted in a way where people know it's a, people are being responsible, the producers are being responsible. Uh, and yet it's just not possible. Danny, go and get him. <laughs> Don't tell Marley. Um, okay, so, uh, I mean, I always like take feedback, so I'm definitely going to be looking at green energy, see if it exists. You might be right. I'll, I'll go and yeah. do it, and I will reach out to you know if I've got questions. Um, uh, I still differ with you on, on whether uh, the uh, warming of the planet is uh, a problem for the planet. I still believe it is. I do. I don't. And, but we can differ there. I mean, we, we <laughs> yeah. said we were going to differ. Yeah. Uh, I, I still think it is because that I know there's impacts. I know there's impacts on like coffee producers in Africa and that they may only have a decade left. It could, they could be wrong. Models, man. Models. Models. A lot of them. The, but, the Maldives were supposed to be underwater 10 years ago and they're just building new airports. Yeah, but, but they're also building up flood defenses. Well, humans are very. But the, the, but, the, but the point being is like, this is where we come to is, is it real if it's not? If, if, if it is, I don't believe policy can fix this. So that's the point. It's like we have a growing population. We have um, a growing need for energy. Uh, if, whether you're right or I'm right, if we are warming the planet by our actions, which uh, there are people who believe we are, um, I believe that we're moving into a world of mitigation and, and planning for that rather than policy to try and reduce well, thank God we have Bitcoin because it forces us to be as energy efficient as possible. That is that is very true. But we should we, we need to look at that stuff. I might even reach out to you before the interview and just tell me the, and I'll I'll, I'll tell Troy. I was like, look, this is what Marley's put into you. Like, this is all well and good, but like, if our starting point is incorrect, if there is no green, then you know, and Nick will be there as well. He can answer the questions as well. Yeah, like, it, 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 there's no green. You can get into the the wind turbines as well. There's a lot of studies being done in wind turbines. Like people don't want it's not, they kill a lot of birds. Kill a lot of birds, but they drive people crazy. If you look at the suicide rates of people between the ages like 18 and 25, and then 60 and 75 in areas where wind turbines have been thrust in the local communities, they increase significantly. Like, why is that? You know, so even I mean, mm, 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 like that just drives people crazy. Um, and then, like, people don't want to look at them. Like, it's hilarious. Up in, I believe it was up in Nantucket or Cape Cod where all the rich LARPers who will fly their private jets over to Scotland, uh, for t- COP26, Good and tell, yeah. tell the rest of us how we need to transition to these green renewables. Uh, somebody will try to put a wind farm 
off the coast uh, of their island up there and, and the, the rich people will throw a fit and say, no, you can't do that. That's going to ruin our, our horizon view. And they, they, they neg it. Um, it's, uh, that, we're going to use more energy. We should certainly, so they, I, I hope this isn't, I am an environmentalist. I surf, I own and live in houses on the coast. Like hey, many, you, you go and clean the beach, right? Yes, I'm a big beach cleaner. Like I, I live on, uh, on the coast for a significant portion of the year. Like if I, like uh, if anybody should be worried about something falling to the ocean, it's me. Like it, I love the ocean. I love the environment. I love nature. Um, I just think that this whole climate hysteria is nothing more than that. And nothing more than hysteria that is again, forcing idiotic, uh, policy decisions and people like that. And think about what we're doing to the children. Like, like Greta, when you're 30, you were, or when you're 28, when you were 16, you said we have 12 years before, uh, like billions of deaths um, happen. Like I, I want to talk to Greta when she's 28 and say, "Hey, do you think you were wrong with that statement? Like, what do you think scaring uh, a whole generation of kids is doing to them psychologically?" And and again, what is like? How do you calibrate as you're going down? this myth too. Like Obama's energy advisor in 1985 said there would be a billion climate related deaths by 2020 climate related deaths between 1985 and 2020 fell by 98%. And that is because we are able to harness our environment and create things that allow us protect us from the cold or uh, especially and the heat as well. Like there's more cold related deaths than heat related deaths as well. Do, and, and do you, do you again bring this back to, uh, incompetence or back to control? Combination of both, right? Yeah. Um, and whacked incentives. And like, so that's the other thing too, with like the green mining. It's going like, it, it only works via subsidies. Like it's like, if there were no subsidies, it'd be un un unprofitable. And I think- That's like Tesla, right? Yeah. And I think a Bitcoin standard will completely obliterate subsidies. So if you want to build massive mining infrastructure on uh, energy resources that would otherwise be unprofitable if there wasn't subsidies, go ahead. We're going to usher in a Bitcoin standard. It's going to wipe out those subsidies and I'll be happy with my off-grid mining operations that aren't leveraging those unreliable and subsidized energy sources. You, you've obviously brought up when we get to a Bitcoin standard. Uh, uh, I had a question from somebody yesterday. It's like, how do you know when we're there? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm there personally. You know, I hold the majority of money in Bitcoin. Uh, I make my purchase. I, well, I, I knew I was definitely there. I've just bought a new house and my broker, I said to him, I want the longest mortgage possible with the lowest possible deposit, which uh, is like my own speculative attack, right? Yes. And so, and I know I'm there because I hold football, the football teams on the Bitcoin standard. I'm on it. The podcast is, you know, the, the decisions are made of, are we buying now? Or are we holding Bitcoin? So I know I'm there, but like when, what's the tipping point where we are as a, maybe a nation or even the world? It all comes back to energy. I think once you start uh, denominating inter international energy trade and SATs, that's, that's when things really, again, energy is the base of society and the most important commodities markets in the world, arguably, alongside the food markets. Um, so once you have international trade getting settled in Bitcoin instead of the dollar, I think that's when you'll know, like, all right, we're we're under a Bitcoin standard. That's interesting because do you believe like the mining will drive that? Because mining is now becoming intrinsically linked to energy production. Uh, we're seeing what's happening here. I always get the name right. Eckhart? Uh, Eckhart? Ercot. The, the, Ercot. I always, Ercot. I always say Ercot. Eckhart. <laughs> was that that Eckhart? Was that the lady who flew the plane? Fuck no. Anyway, uh, Ercot. Uh, it's now, now Amelia in, Earnhardt. Amelia Earnhardt, see, I'm so bad with names. This is an age thing. <laughs> I always forget you're like fucking 14 years younger than me or something. Um, I forget all names. Uh, but the um, the energy grid here is now intrinsically linked to Bitcoin, right? Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, with the, the starting point of it. With the demand, so this is another like controversial take with like the demand response here in Texas. Like again, they're they're leveraging this demand response and they're overbuilding capacity of wind and solar specifically to to create these demand response programs for a lot of miners. And I just think that again, it's completely stupid. Like you can build as much wind and solar capacity, you can build hundreds of gigawatts of capacity hypothetically, but that doesn't stop the wind from stop 
stopping the blow and the sun from not piercing the clouds when you can't control the weather. And we found like there was an instance here two weeks ago in Texas where it got really cold and uh, wind production fell to zero, wasn't producing any electricity. And so while I do think the concept of demand response does make sense, I think there are a lot of miners here in Texas and a lot of LARPers around this demand response meme that are, are basically creating a, a scenario where miners and the, the demand response program in and of itself is going to look bad in the future because, <laughs> you can, again, you can build out as much wind as you want, but you can't make the wind blow. Like If you're going to do the demand response, I think you should be doing that by building something like a natural gas peaker plant or expanding natural gas um, uh, natural gas production or nuclear. Like it should be nuclear, but again, the, the political will to build these nuclear plants doesn't exist in the United States because we have a regulatory body that won't um, okay any any new construction. Well, uh, why is that? What are they saying? Is it to do with <laughs> the nuclear yeah, waste? Environmental bullshit, but I think, uh, I think it's pretty well known at this point in time that the... Nuclear reactors, especially the, the small modular reactors, are significantly safer than anything that was being produced like in the 60s or 70s. That's the like Series 4 yes. ones. Um, just going back to the uh, pricing energy and sats, uh, you've been involved with mining companies. Mm -hmm. Do they themselves operate on a Bitcoin standard in that they're mining Bitcoin and they're considering the energy they buy, even though they probably have to pay dollars, but are they considering it? Are they uh, on a Bitcoin standard themselves? Some are. Um, yeah, I can't talk specifics about companies I'm working with, or but like there are we're talking. I'll just say generally throughout the industry, people are having conversations in oil and gas specifically, where all right, you can get your natural gas, whether it be flared or stranded, and turn it into sats, uh, and and get that previously wasted resource and turn it into significant revenue. There are plenty of oil and gas companies, particularly more smaller, uh, middle-sized producers that want to hold Bitcoin on their balance sheet, and they're doing that. But I, I think that will accelerate, and that will actually, oil and gas specifically, will, will drive the transition to a Bitcoin standard and start pricing their commodities and sats because they're going to have that Bitcoin on the balance sheet. They're going to see it appreciate. They're going to be like, why would I ever sell my precious oil for, for dollars on the open market? Like I want to seeing what my sats production is doing for my balance sheet. Um, mm. On the natural gas side, like I, I do want to begin selling um, oil in, in in Sats as well. And what, uh, what will be funny to say, and I said this at the Houston meetup um, a couple months ago, is what would be really interesting to see, not funny to see, very interesting to see, is what happens. Like, do Bitcoin miners become energy producers first, or do energy producers become massive Bitcoin miners first? Like, who becomes who's first? That's what I think the biggest question in the convergence of the mining and energy sectors is right now. Or is it just both and there'll be some mergers and acquisitions? I, 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 there'll definitely be mergers and acquisitions. Me, I'm for, I want like the, the mining operations I'm involved in, I want to become an energy producer. I want to own natural gas. I want to own oil wells and sell oil to market for SATs because um, you need to. If you want to survive mining, mining, again, is a industry and in in an endeavor that demands you to vertically integrate as much as you can from uh, the construction of the, the where your miners sit to the um, energy source that is used to um, get converted into electricity to the thing that converts that thing to electricity. And then beyond that, at a certain scale, you can create your own mining pool. Then you have hash rate derivatives. Like miners are replacing central banks, the energy sector via mining is going to replace the central banking system. Well, it's a bit like exchanges. Do they become banks or banks become exchanges like in the same kind yes. of like... Well, that's another thing too. Like it's do and, and when we're playing this out 10, 20 years, like do miners just become exchanges as well? Because I think this is something that's not talked about a lot um, in the industry, but something I'm very passionate, I don't know if passionate is the right word, but I, like I have a very strong belief that at some point, in the next 10 years as Bitcoin appreciates and people really begin to adopt Bitcoin in mass across the world, exchanges are going to have liquidity problems. Like you're going to have problems finding liquidity to 
uh, sell Bitcoin to people. Like eventually exchanges won't even matter because we'll be on a Bitcoin standard. But if exchanges do want to persist and evolve, they're going to need access to liquidity and SATs liquidity. And so I actually think if you're an exchange right now, you should be getting exposure to mining companies because they, they're going to be liquidity providers for you in the future. Like a, the OTC desk, I could see drying up and like the only source of liquidity being mining entities. And so I think thinking 10, 20 years ahead, if you're an exchange and you want to survive and thrive and evolve uh, to what the market needs at that given point in time, like getting uh, ownership stake in a, in a miner or creating a forward contract market where you can you can pre-buy Bitcoin uh, via miner by paying cash up front that allows them to expand their operations. And then you can buy sats at a discount to market in the future i think that part of the market needs to evolve could be wrong but i think structurally in my mind seeing how this plays out that's where where it will go as more people uh adopt bitcoin you have somewhat of a um liquidity dry up on the exchange side it's interesting these markets that are kind of propping up and the way you look at it in the future that there's going to be markets for sats there's going to be market these mar- new markets for energy new markets for even hash power mm-hmm. yeah that, that are going to be traded okay people are discussing whether or not there will be futures markets for fees for for block space yeah um, we're at the very early days that's that's why it's so exciting um well it's kind of wild as well because if you look back at what satoshi tried to do is peer-to-peer money um, and uh, and that's not a nod to Roger Ver peer to peer money, <laughs> uh, but it's the ability just to transfer money around the world permissionlessly on, on a, a censorship resistant without um, on a fixed uh, fixed limit of twenty one million. It was this, this unique idea, but I don't think he foresaw all these fucking things that are now molding around it. There's no way he I think he could have foreseen the impact this was going to have on the energy market or the way people. You know, people are going to think about these future markets. I mean, like you say, these markets, these futures for for buying a block space. It's kind of crazy the way the way it's come from an idea of a protocol to send money around the world to all this new stuff. Yeah, and what like that's, what's going to come that we've not even thought about? I mean, that's uh, I mean, I want to get cosmic here. I mean, that's the get uh, cosmic, go Marty. I mean, that's one of the series of I mean, get your whiskey if you want. <laughs> no, I've got to got to help my brother move after this, believe it or not, but. Oh. Um, yeah, is Bitcoin sort of like a, a great filter test for intergalactic species? Ooh. Where, like, if humans successfully adopt a Bitcoin standard, uh, is that a point in which like, people beyond Earth are like, all right, this is an advanced enough society they can join our um, our intergalactic? Uh, Do you think so? That the um, we've seen these recent videos of people coming to visit us. <laughs> the Tic Tacs. Are they coming to check we are advanced enough? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, leave those fucking idiots alone at the moment. They're still having wars. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. They haven't figured this shit out. Yeah. And that's, um, yeah. I, we can't even fathom where this is going to take us. I mean, just seeing it on the podcasting side with podcasting 2.0, the fact that you can put a Lightning Network public address in your RSS feed and people around the world can send send me sats per minute they listen to my podcast. Like I that never would have thought that was possible like five years ago. Um, and it's possible now. I'm just thinking about how this gets injected into every facet of our lives and every industry is, is again, we can't even fathom how it's going to affect things. Man, well, this isn't the show I thought we would make. <laughs> I thought I was going to talk about all our differences, but now I've got like shit. We've got new energy stuff to to research and prepare for Troy. Man, um, the only other thing I wanted to talk to you about was a bit about governance, uh, but on a political level because we've got a lot of politicians getting involved in Bitcoin. I'm sure you've had a few write to you and say, "Can I come on your show?" Mm-hmm. Um, it's easy to reject them because they don't really. We, we was talking about it yesterday. It's like. Uh, if they if if them coming on the show is good for Bitcoin, I would consider it. But if it's mainly good for them, I won't. And I think a lot of them are seeing the the Bitcoin hack. Yes, which I think is good. I think we should leverage that hack. Just like we should, but I'm just not having six a month on the show. No, <laughs> talking about it. Um, but uh, on like on on a governor's level, you're obviously very cynical about the state. You're very critical. Where what direction do you think we're heading? Because 
uh, I'm I'm not in that place where I think even on a Bitcoin standard we don't have some form of sovereign currency. Certainly not in the short term. Even if the dollar fails, I think it will be replaced by a, a new dollar. Mm-hmm. If the pound fails, it will be replaced by a new pound, or it will fail and it will just be debased further. But like I, I'm not in that place where I think we only have Bitcoin just yet, or certainly not at least for maybe multiple decades. Um, and we are in this weird place where uh, states are getting more authoritarian. Um, we recognize it, you recognize it, um, we've seen, we've all seen what's happening in Canada, but I don't, I struggle to see, I always struggle to see a world without the state, I'm not one of those people, but I, I, I know you're very critical, but I don't know your position on all of this. Yeah, I think the federal government's incompetent, evil, and should be abolished, uh, <laughs> particularly here in the United States. Uh, they're but, inefficient, they, it doesn't make anybody's lives better off. Again, it's a very centralized system with perverse incentives trying to control complex systems and i just don't think that's viable number one or beneficial number two and i think we're seeing the products of that play out but state government you yeah so that's what i think that the silver lining of covid the lockdowns and everything that unfolded over the last two two years is this reassertion of state autonomy and states rights particularly florida and texas are the two um, most popular examples of people will get, but there were many other states uh, across the United States that did not go along with federal govern- government recommendations, mandates. And I think that's only going to continue moving forward. Uh, I think the, the federal government is completely bloated. I think we need to continue this trend of uh, emboldening states uh, and, 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 making it so we have a, a republic of autonomous states, which is what this country was supposed to be when it was founded and got completely bastardized over the, the last two centuries, two and a half centuries. Um, How does that coordinate if you have no federal government? Don't you since you just have 52 small federal governments? 50, yeah, yeah, 50, yeah. And those, you have a uh, better competition. But don't you have to have some kind of something that kind of centrally arranges... Or has it just become fifty-two countries that you can? Yeah, I think I think we should see a balkanization of everything. And again, yeah. information—that's the problem with the federal government. You have a bunch of individuals in a central location in D.C. who are so disconnected from the sources of information necessary to make educated decisions and correct decisions for for localities. It, it literally doesn't make sense from an information dispersion perspective like they, they are literally so disconnected from like so you have somebody in, uh, in some small town in louisiana they have a road that needs to be fixed and um or they have very specific healthcare problems in their local community that that need certain remedies and you have a broad brush from dc trying to you know, basically solve this problem not knowing like granular information on the ground and i think the the best people to make those decisions are that local community that county that state uh that city whatever it be and i think we should be emboldening those entities at the grassroots level and i think we'll get better results um by that like people people's tax dollars shouldn't be like half of them should be like a insane amount of tax revenue should not be directed to DC where they just completely waste the money and, and enrich contractors and the, the war machine um, with, with little benefit coming back to the, to the little guy in a small town. Like I think taxes, if, if there are going to be taxes should be insulated to, to your local community, your state at the, at the highest level. You're not anti-tax. Uh, I think, yeah, I mean, I am, but like I recognize if they are going to be levied, they, I would like them to be at the local insulated level. at the local level, at the state level. And it's one step forward yes. away from federal government. And it's one thing I really, like I always talk about, I envy the US so much that you have a republic, that you have states, you have that state. We don't have it. It doesn't matter whether you live in... Cornwall in the south of England, or you move to Manchester, it's exactly the same set of rules. There's no incentive locally for governors to improve. Yeah. You just don't have that. It's- and, and even to add to that, like the local politics politicians have like no power in the UK. Like very little happens on a local level. And nobody cares. Like I've never voted in a local election <laughs> ever. I've yeah. never. And if I have, I've only done it because I've gone to vote in the national election and 
by virtue of that, I'm voting locally, but there's no interest. You don't care. You don't know who they are. You don't know what they're doing. It's not like here where you have Governor Abbott, very out there, very public, very vocal. You have to take, like you have a bunch of very vocal, high profile people creating policy locally. We just don't have that. There's no, I mean, there's, there's been a little bit of devolution between across the UK, between Northern Ireland and Scotland and Wales, and they have control over certain policy, like health policy or education policy, but it's very, very minuscule and it's, it's just shit. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's getting better here in the United States, but it's, it's shit. I mean, just look at the goddamn state of the union address that was given last night. Biden was calling Ukrainians, Uranians, and you had like Nancy Pelosi <laughs> looking like a deranged clown rubbing it. Like these are the people making decisions for 360 million or 330 million people across the U.S. It's, Literally, it feels like we're living in a Truman show, like clown show. It's like, how have we gotten to a point where these we wouldn't allow these people to drive cars? Yeah. Like literally, like Biden would not be allowed to drive a car. Nancy Pelosi <laughs> wouldn't be allowed to drive a car. And we're letting them run the country. And that's why I, I probably see it on Twitter and my newsletter. Like I've been vehemently pushing, like, all right, we need to embolden states. And we, like, and that's why I'm very happy, Texas. Uh, Florida, Wyoming, Tennessee, Oklahoma, Kentucky, many other states have stood up last two years and be like, we're not, we're not going along with this. Like Florida, like went so far as like Biden requested, um, requested from Florida that they send up uh, some of their their state like Coast Guard uh, uh, soldiers or military men to go protect uh, dc during the state of the union it's like no i'm not setting them up there for you like that i, I, I want to see more of that i want to see bitcoin mining permanent funds in states that that have rich energies um that have energy abundance and a lot of energy sources under their land i think wyoming if you're watching if you're listening uh, i've been trying to meme the wyoming bitcoin mining permanent fund i think they should issue bonds at a very take advantage of low interest rate market issue bonds invest that money in mining infrastructure tap open some orphan wells that exist and then roll that uh, some of that revenue into a bitcoin permanent fund um you, you'll take um you'll you'll take advantage of bitcoin's price appreciation but then on top of that you you, you are empowered uh, against the federal government, where the federal government holds a lot of its power over over individual states by saying, "Oh, if you want money from the taxes that we've uh, acquired this year, like you have to do this, that, and the other." If you have a Bitcoin mining permanent fund, it allows you number one to lower state taxes, but number two it gives you leverage against the federal government, where it says, "Ah, thanks, but no thanks. We're, we're good." Yeah. Um, and it's totally possible. Like I think. Um, like and Bitcoiners make it like mad. Like are you telling the state to get into um, Bitcoin? I'm not saying these states. I'm saying individual states. Um, I, I think it makes sense for them, and only if it's used for the public good to to reduce taxes. In Wyoming, after Biden came in and immediately shut down uh, new mineral leases on federal lands, which Wyoming has a lot of federal land, and that's where a lot of their oil and gas industry is focused. Um, Biden came in day one, signed an order that didn't allow them to actually facilitate their oil and gas industry in the state. And it wiped out their tax revenue. And Wyoming was very conservative. And they were put in this position, do we raise taxes or do we fire teachers? And they were never going to raise taxes. So they fired a bunch of teachers. Um, if they had a Bitcoin mining permanent fund, who's to say they would even have to be put in that situation? That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marty, thanks um, for coming on. <laughs> thanks. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> no, this is aggro great. rambling. No, no, no. This is good. Like, this, I, I always want to talk to you because I, you always make me recon reconsider things. If when I sit and talk to people I agree with, I don't learn anything. I was saying yesterday, or chatting to uh, you know Susie on Twitter, Susie Bob. You must know. Anyway, I was saying I, I always want to talk to people I disagree with or think about things differently because that's when you learn. Like, if you yeah. always talk to people you agree with. Your position never changes. You're never challenged. And one thing I think we need more in modern society too is like civil discussion. Like this, yeah. like hope people can recognize that we can disagree, and like yeah. we don't have to like fucking like give each other the finger and like be uncivil about yeah. things. Like you, can, so like we need to bring back civility to these types of conversations. Um, we need to 
because again, that's that's part of the. Where there's so much division in society, like you can't even have a productive conversation in a lot of cases, just because people come in, but pre others are created, and it's like if just again via the propaganda machine, there's people are labeled as others and. You're not supposed to be able to approach them to have a conversation. And I think that's. I think there's another part that goes with that 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 ability or willingness to know you might be wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, you you know my position on the environment. I've been very clear about it, but I could be wrong on some of this, or I could be right, but like the incentives can't be solved. I don't know. But if I only spoke to people who are environmentalists, who are climate scientists, who agree with me that I'm going to continue to repeat what they've said. Today I've told you my opinion based on those people I've talked to, but it's like shit. We've got some me and Danny got some work to do, and you know if we do our digging, we're like, okay, Marley's right, or Marley's got some good points here. And when I sit and talk to Troy and I sit and talk to Nick, I'm gonna say, look, this is all this is all well and good, but what about you know what about the uh, the uh, production? Uh, the issues with production of solar panels. What about the issues with the production of uh, wind farms? Like, what about these issues? Like, are you sure you? And, and that only happens by talking to someone who's comes from a different point of view. So, like, uh, I I always like, yeah, you know, sit down, and talk to you, Marty. It's always a pleasure for me too, Peter. I mean, there's a there's a, a quiet brotherhood between Bitcoin podcasters that oh, many don't know about. Yeah, little secret conversations offline. But, <laughs> uh, but no, it's it's great to see you crushing it as well, man. Like all the things you're doing, uh, I love the bent. You know how much I love the bent. I share it out, and uh, me and me and Danny will look forward to this. So I appreciate you coming on and keep crushing it. And uh, I'm here for two weeks, so we got to get a steak. Yeah, we'll definitely get many steaks. And congrats on the win today. Thank you for having Thank me. Thank you. Yeah, come on, Bedford. All right, man. <laughs> well, listen, good to see you, man. All right.